Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Good morning, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. Silencio. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Jonathan Royce I'm with Data in the Development Department. So, because I want to be respectful of the mission report, gotcha, Sarah, um, I'm going to just jump on into this. Um, I'm going to be sharing something from 1 Samuel, and I'm calling it um, King, in, King in, in Exchange for the King of Kings. And so, today I just want to discuss 1 Samuel. Um, with a focus on chapter 8, and after arriving, be, but before arriving to chapter 8, I just want us to review um, what's been taking place leading up to chapter 8. So, just do it real quick. Um, in chapter 1, we learn about the faithfulness and faith of Hannah as she cries out for God during her suffering. We see God's sovereignty as he closes and opens Hannah's womb to conceive a child. Um, we also go and see that um, the, the birth of Samuel and Hannah's song of thanksgiving to God. We see the rejection of the house of Eli, the initiation of Samuel as prophet. Um, God's power is, to, is, is displayed as the ark is captured by the Philistines, and the ark of, is placed in Philistia, and, and then the ark is returned to, to Israel um, as we get into chapter 6. But then we see God's sovereignty, uh, sovereignty orchestrating all things, from Samuel's birth to the victory of the Philistines and capturing the ark in 1 Samuel 4. And then if you take a look at Samuel 4, 2 through 4, it says the Philistines drew up in the line against Israel. And when the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men in the field of battle. And when the people came to the camp, the elders said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the covenant of the Lord to Shiloh, and that it may come among us and save us from the power of our enemies. Did you notice something there? The elders question, why has the Lord defeated us? And not by the Philistines, but before the Philistines. And, and, but they didn't even wait for an answer. They immediately take matters in their own hands and they say, let us bring the ark. See, the elders' apparent conviction that the ark has magical guarantee of the Lord's presence is similar to that of the Philistines that we see in chapter nine, 7 and 9. And salvation depends on God's free initiative and sovereign grace, not on human techniques or schemes. And now in 1 Samuel, Samuel gathers Israel and prays for them. They cry out to God. We have sinned against the Lord. The Philistines hear that Israel is gathered and they attempt to use their vulnerability to take advantage to attack. And then Israel hears about this and how do they react? They were afraid. And how quickly they forgot about all that God had accomplished for them, and how little faith they had. And yet, in spite of their sinfulness, Samuel cries out to God on behalf of the people. And in 1 Samuel 7.10 says, As Samuel was offering a burnt offering, the Philistines drew up near to attack Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against Is the, the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were defeated before Israel. The Lord thundered, and the Philistines were defeated by Israel? No. They were defeated before Israel. It was all the work of our sovereign God. After all that, it, that God had accomplished for, on behalf of Israel, the unfaithfulness is great. Listen to God's words in Hosea 11, 1 through 4. The Lord's love for Israel. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Israel called, the Egyptians, uh, called to the Egyptians even as Israel was leaving them. They kept sacrificing the bells and burning offerings to idols. It was... I who taught the, taught Ephraim to walk, taken them into, by hand, by they, but they never knew that I healed them. I led them with human cords and with ropes of love. To them I was like one who eases the yoke of the jaw, of their jaws. I bent down to give them food. Psalm seventy eight ten through eleven says they did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to His law. They forgot His works and wonders, and He and all that He had shown them. And then it goes on in seventy eight. How often they rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. They tested God again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. They did not remember his power of, or the day when he redeemed them from their foe. 
And then it continues in this chapter, yet tested and rebelled against the most high God and did not keep his testimonies, <clears throat> excuse me, but t turned away and acted treacherously like their fathers. They twisted like deceitful bell. So let's read one chapter one, eight through, um, well, eight, four through 20. And so it says this, Now appoint us a king to judge us like, like all the other nations. And the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to, to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, <clears throat> excuse me, but they have rejected me from being the, over, the king over them. According to all, their deed, all the deeds that I have done from the day I brought them out of Egypt, even to this day, forsaken me in serving other gods, so they are also doing to you. Now then, obey their voice, and sh you, only you shall solemnly warn them, how, how the, the, uh, show them the ways of the king who will reign over them. And so uh, real quickly, in, in verse 10, uh, Samuel tells them the words of the Lord of the people, asking them um, for this king, and he explains what's going to happen. And from 11 to 17, he says, the king will use the people for selfish purposes and gain. They will, he will take their women and servants and they, will, and they will serve him. He will take their possessions and make them make slaves of all of them. And then in 18 he states, And that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. And how did the people respond in 19? But the, Lord, but the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but there shall be a king over us that we may also be like the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles the the word of the lord the, the word of god is not about us it's about god and all the things and all things in the old and new testament re reveal human depravity and god's attributes and his sovereignty all things in, in the word of god point to christ see we do not we do not want to be ruled and governed by a sovereign God. No, we, we want to be like the other nations ruled by men. And pride, arrogance, and idolatry is the story of Israel, and that's the story of you and I as well. Today, we, we see nations of uh, a falling world, consumed by politics and placing our hopes in presidents and leaders rather than in an omnipotent, sovereign, holy God. We are a political party before being biblical. We deny clear biblical truth and compromise to man and sinful desires. We deny God's sovereignty over all things and elevate our free will, uh, which the Bible says is bound by sin. So we allow God to be on the throne to meet our wants and desires, but not on the throne and in control of our salvation and sanctification. We refuse to obey the commands of God and his word. And when it is convenient, we are Christians and he is our king. But when he demands, when his demands inconveniences us, we rebel and seek an alternative. Oh, what wretched sinners we are. I'm speaking to myself for that. Listen to these words. I believe in one God, the creator of, and governor of the universe, the rewarder of good, and the punisher of the wicked. And I do acknowledge the scriptures in Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. See, where do you think that was from? One of the church confessions? No, this was actually a section from the Pennsylvania Constitution of 1776. And every member of the House of Representatives, before taking a seat, was required to subscribe to this declaration. How far we have come rejecting God as our king and governor over all things. And First Chronicles 28.9 says, Know the God of your father and serve him wholeheartedly and with a willing mind. And the Lord searches every heart and understands the intention of every thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you abandon him, he will reject you forever. See, the nations have rejected the sovereign holy God of the Bible and turned to themselves for self-governance. They use God and Christianity for personal gain and when they do not... And when they don't even know the true God of Christianity, much less the very biblical definition of Christianity and what it is to be a Christian. Then they, they, when they gain what they desire, they once again abandon God and Christianity, and they twist and reject God's words, just as Psalms 50:17 says, they hate instruction and, and fling my words behind you. And so we go on, and, and if you, this, this is not, the problem is not just nations and rulers who are guilty of this. And I'm not going to speak on unbelievers, for we, we have a clear understanding of that reason, of their rejection of God. 1 Corinthians 4.4 4 says, in their case, the God of this age has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. No, I, I wish to focus upon you and I, and believers who prof and professing Christians. Today, Christianity does not reflect the biblical truths of the first century. Today's teachings in majority of Christian churches have a low view of God and a high view of man. 
They teach that man has complete free will and, can, and choose right and wrong to sin or not sin, to accept Christ or reject Christ, and then one day they feel more spiritual, and so they accept Christ once again. They say God did not create robots, and we we we're, we have our own wills, and and he and no, he he gives us our own will to do what we please. They say that man is essentially good when Romans 3 actually says no one is good, not even one. God is torn down from his sovereign holy throne and man is elevated to little gods who are powerful and God patiently waits upon them, begging us to love him. Many who fill church pews and carry the label Christian seem to love God, but want the benefits of God, his peace, comfort, and prosperity, but don't truly want God of the Bible and surrender their life to him. They say, God, my God is a God of love, not of wrath or jealousy. He is a God, he is in control of most things, but not all things. This is not the God of the Bible they claim to know. This is a false fabricated God of their imagination, and truth is not from the individual's opinion or imagination. Truth is what God decrees. God is sovereign over all things, or he's sovereign over nothing. We were dead in our sins, incapable to love and obey the true God of the Bible. It is he who decrees all things in a being, yet we're responsible for our sinfulness. It is he who elects us, who calls us, who seeks us, his spirit that makes spiritually dead men come to life and have faith. He who bends our will towards his, his, his righteousness is imputed upon us. His spirit is, seals us. It's he who sanctifies us, one day glorifies us. God's will is his perfect determination and sovereign ordination of all things, pertaining both to himself, including his decrees and actions, and his creation, including events of history and the thoughts and actions of people, all unto the magnification of his utmost glory. Everything depends on God's will. From creation to preservation, Psalms 135.6, the Lord does whatever he pleases in heaven and earth and the seas of all the depths. Job 37.10-13, ice is formed by his breath and watery expanses are frozen. He saturates clouds with moisture. He scatters his, his lightning through them. They twirl around and turning around and around at his direction, accompanying everything he commands them over the surface of the inhabited world. He causes this to happen for punishment, for his land, and for his faithful love. And he's, he's sovereign of government, Proverbs 21.1. The king's heart is like a channeled water in the, hands, in the Lord's hands. He directs it wherever he chooses. An election of reprobation, Romans 9.15-16, For he tells Moses, I will show mercy on whom I shall show mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I shall have some compassion. So then it does not depend on human will or effort, but on, God's, on God who shows mercy. In Ephesians 1, 11 through 12, in him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to his plan of the one who works out everything in agreement to the purpose of his will so that, that, we, are, that we who had already our hope in Christ might pr bring praise to his glory. In Proverbs 16, 4, the Lord has prepared everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of disaster. In the suffering of Christ, he was sovereign. Acts 4, 27, 28. For in fact, in this day, in the city, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, assembled together against our, your holy servant Jesus, who you anointed, and, and, and to do whatever your hand and your will had predestined to take place. Regeneration, which is given a new heart of, to a spiritually dead person. 1 John, excuse me, John 1, 13. Uh, whom were born not of natural descent, but the, not, or not of the will of the flesh, or the will of man, but of God. And our sanctification, Philippians 2.13, For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according to his good purpose. And the suffering of believers, 1 Peter 3.17, For it is better to suffer for, to do, for doing good, if that should be God's will, than to do evil. And man's life and destiny, Isaiah 45, 9, Woe to the one who argues with his maker, one clay pot making many. Does the clay say to uh, the one forming it, what are you making? Or does your work say, he has no hands? James 4, 15, instead you should say, if the Lord wills, we will live and do this or that. And he's sovereign over all the smallest things, Matthew 10, 29, Aren't two sparrows sold for a penny, and not one of them falls to the ground without the Father's consent? Therefore, this reduction of the sovereignty of God is in fact a rejection of, the, of him as king of kings. However, you may think, I have a high view of God and his sovereignty, and, but how many times has God spoken to you through his word to instruct you to do something and you reject it? The times you call your sins error or mistakes denying your rebellion against a holy God. The times you were commanded to lead your home biblically, 
the times you are commanded to pray without obligation. Study because you hunger for righteousness. Interpret the word of God properly, not interjection your desires of definition in the text. Evangelize and make disciples. Uh, speak difficult truths to even profession Christians. Love others intensely. Change sinfulness in your character, but God, but said, I know God has commanded me to do this, but this makes me feel uncomfortable, and I'm content where I am and, I, and who I am. I will do some things he asks of me, but I'm not going to do that. We are essentially rejecting God as king of our lives and replacing him with self. And so God is commanding us today, today to turn back to his sovereign will for our lives. 1 Thessalonians 4, 7, 8 says, For God has not called us to impurity, but to live in holiness. Consequently, anyone who rejects this does not reject man, but God who gives you his Holy Spirit. So let's stop making excuses for sinfulness and let's end the debates over biblical truths and let's elevate our view of God and not only preach this truth, but live it. And so I pray that our comfort zones are shaken to pieces, leaving our broken, us broken before an almighty holy cr God crying out for him to pick up the pieces of our wretchedness and see him, and, and he as our king, our potter, and mold us into the image of Christ from this day forth, never being the same again. God is eternal and omnipresent. He is never outside of, we are never outside of his presence. He is not only good, but he's the source of goodness and illumination of his holiness. He is just and righteous and his wrath towards all and has wrath towards all that goes against his will and jealous as he demands fidelity. Yet because of his awesome, unexplainable grace and deep love for those he has elected, he is patiently waiting for them to come to salvation as he draws them, demonstrating his mercy through his endless wisdom. All powerful and all knowing, truthful and fearful, he transcends all things. There is nothing like him as he is indescribable, incomparable and worthy of glory and honor. Sovereign in all aspects of humanity and creation, working all things for his glory and our good. This is the God of all creation, the, the great I am who adopted us through salvation. Is he truly king over all things in your life? And if not, let's take up our cross and truly follow him. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I'm the worst of them. But I, re but I receive mercy for this reason, so that in me the worst of them Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor, glory forever and ever. Amen. 1 Timothy 1, 15, 17. So I hope that encourages you all, and may God bless you.